I had initially wanted to call this segment Criterion Corner because, hey look, there's a corner right there and I'm here to talk about a Criterion Collection movie, specifically 1984 directed by Michael Radford. Unfortunately that name was taken so this will be Criterion Cove. Why not? Um, this movie came out on Blu-ray a couple of weeks ago, um, and the movie came out uh, 35 years ago in 1984, appropriately enough, and I want to talk about it. Um, this was uh, a film that I had not seen, despite having been a huge fan of George Orwell's novel on which it was based, and I got the chance to watch it a couple of nights ago, and then I watched the special features, all of them, so that I can come and talk about them with you. Uh, if you are a fan of uh, the film, uh, or if you're just a fan of the book and never seen the movie, this is something something I can recommend seeing, uh, buying, renting, whatever, watching uh, Sight Unseen. It is, uh, it's fantastic and one of the most faithful adaptations of a book that I've seen. There's only a couple of details that were left out um, and once that you are made aware of them, particularly in the special features, uh, they are kind of glaring but uh, not showstoppers by any, by any means. Um, the film is the, the second film by Michael Radford and also the second film of Roger Deakins. Uh, who many people will know as the cinematographer of a bunch of the Coen Brothers movies such as No Country for Old Men and Fargo and the James Bond movie Skyfall, just a legend. And this is pretty much where he got uh, his start, uh, almost you know, fresh out of film school practically. Um, and it shows. Uh, the transfer uh, in this 1984 version uh, is so pristine that it looks like it was shot today. Now that shouldn't be very surprising because Criterion is known for their, their astonishing polish work and, and making everything look and sound and pop just beautifully. Even you know, ancient films look like they were made yesterday. Um, and that's certainly the case with 1984. Um, but one of the things that you really get an appreciation from uh, the special features, especially there's a 20-minute interview uh, with Roger Deakins and also a 20-minute plus interview uh, with Michael Radford, they talk about the origin of the production, which is very cool. I mean, it's essentially uh, an independent film and the way they got everybody to come together um, from financing to finding the actors, particularly how John Hurt got involved. Um, these are the, the kind of Hollywood fairy tale stories that uh, you just hear and you're like, I, I, anything can happen. This is, it's, it's beautiful. Um, but Roger Deakins talks about uh, not only shooting the film, but the fact that everything, uh, all of the effects in the movie were done practically which uh, if you watch the movie straight through uh, with sort of a modern mindset, which I did, frankly, because it looked so new that it's hard to put my mind into the frame of, oh, this was made a really long time ago. So you see these giant Big Brother view screens all over the landscape, and you figure, oh, that was just added in later. Um, it's, it's not a big deal, especially today in the age of uh, digital everything where they have monitors and TV screens and computer monitors that uh, the content is inserted after the film is shot. You don't even think about it. But because all of this was done in camera, Deacon talks about, or sorry, Deacons, uh, talks about the processes of shooting in such a way that uh, the images on the view screens could be projected uh, in the room, on the day, on the set, uh, and sometimes uh, interacting with the people who are looking at the view screens. Um, it's, it's quite an amazing feat. Um, I'm not doing it justice because you know no one explains <laughs> filmmaking like Roger Deakin, so definitely go check that that feature out. Um, but uh, it's pretty phenomenal. Uh, if you've seen the movie, you know that there is a, sort of a fantasy sequence uh, in which Winston, played by John Hurt, uh, imagines walking down a cold, dark corridor and opening room 101, which ends up being the torture chamber at the end. Spoilers if you haven't read the book or seen the film. Sorry, uh, and he opens up on this lush green pasture, these rolling hills, and it's it's beautiful, and you realize, uh, watching this, the special features and watching uh, Radford especially talk about this, they found this beautiful countryside and constructed a long hallway set and lit it just so that the actors could walk down that corridor and open it up and have something that essentially would have to be a special effect, uh, something that was done separately, incorporated into the film later, uh, doing it all uh, right there, uh, constructing a set and doing everything in camera. Um, it's really amazing. And I think especially for young filmmakers, uh, people who are interested in the history and also working you know, without a budget because uh, these guys did not have much of a budget at the time. This was an independent picture, as I mentioned. Um, really figuring out ways to be inventive and make what you have stretch to its ultimate uh, ultimate ends, its, its greatest possibilities. 
watching this, the uh, the interviews, I was very much inspired, and I wanted to go back and rewatch the movie again. Now, helpfully, uh, the folks at Criterion incorporated uh, some of the footage back into the interviews. So when Deacons is talking about a particular shot, you get a sense for you know the the lighting tricks that he was that he's talking about. Uh, it really makes you reconsider the film in a completely different way, even if you'd watched it 24 hours before. Um, I will say. Uh, if you need an example, I'm not recommending everybody do this, but this is the way I had to watch it. If you need an example of, of just how phenomenal the transfer is on this Blu-ray, um, put in the movie and watch about 20 minutes of it, and then turn it off, and then go rent it from Amazon, which you can do for about three bucks uh, in standard definition, uh, and watch the rest of the movie that way. Unfortunately, that's how I had to watch it uh, because I live in a house with uh, two kids and a wife who like to sleep while I'm doing my movie stuff often. Uh, it's not always easy to watch a Blu-ray. Um, sometimes I just have to rent something on the laptop and watch it with uh, headphones plugged in. So I got to watch uh, part of 1984 the way it was meant to be seen on this, this great transfer and the rest of it I had to watch on the kind of a crappy uh, Amazon digital streaming transfer. And not that it was bad, it just was not polished. It was probably a, a transfer from an old DVD or something. And the, the difference is just staggering. And I got to watch the special features uh, in high definition. Um, and so watching that, I got to see the movie that I had just watched, but it's like watching something in black and white and then immediately seeing it in color. It's, it's completely revelatory. Um, some of the other interviews uh, they have on the disc, uh, one is with author David Ryan, who wrote a book called George Orwell on Screen, and he goes into the history of the other uh, page to screen productions of 1984 and their their triumphs and their their tragedies and how they stack up to uh, the Radford version uh, the consensus pretty much is that Radford got it completely right and in ways that uh, you know casual fans might not appreciate but those who are really into the novel uh, will get why the choices he made were very important so I'm being kind of cryptic here because I don't want to spoil everything um, but yeah so watch uh, 1984 uh, for the for the sets for the camera work but also for the performances I mean John Hurt who many people will know from Alien or Harry Potter or the rest of his you know terrifically illustrious career um, I've never seen him uh, in a role like this before uh, particularly in the scenes where he's being tortured uh, at the hands of Richard Burton who is who plays O'Brien who is one of the arms of the state or big brother um, John Hurt uh, really puts himself through hell. Uh, he's skinny as a rail, he's crying, he's practically foaming at the mouth, um, and watching some of the behind-the-scenes footage uh, and the way that Radford talks about getting that performance out of him, uh, you understand that by the time he gets to what you see on screen, he is practically being tortured, uh, suffering for his art, uh, as it were. So, yeah, it's a... Um, it's a it's a high recommendation for me now again I'm not getting too much into the plot uh, because I assume a lot of you have seen 1984 and if you haven't this is a fantastic opportunity to to catch up on it and also to read the book um, one of the cool things that uh, David Ryan talks about uh, the author of that Orwell book I mentioned is some of the themes and how uh, Orwell was politically uh, pretty much uh, a socialist, but he made the villains in the film uh, the socialist state um, to underscore that even the people that he considered to be on the right side of political history uh, can go off the rails and can go wrong. Now, uh, 1984, as I mentioned in the last video I did about uh, cancel culture in the movie The Hunt, um, people like to say that uh, in any political era where there is uh, a particular brand of turmoil uh, that is just like 1984 and we're living through that again. Um, but it's really easy to see how you can take uh, any period uh, of you know, government um, <laughs> rule, it, it, party irregardless, uh, and see parallels to the universe that George Orwell created. Uh, one of the most chilling things that um, I drew from this movie is how, uh, and it's not an original idea, certainly, I, I think I've heard other um, other takes on this same notion, but it really hit home watching uh, 1984 and Criterion, uh, was that George Orwell could not have imagined 2019 uh, America or 2019 Western world in which we're carrying around Big Brother in our back pockets and we're asking to be surveilled. Um, whether it's you know constantly being on cameras, uh, creating videos that are uploaded to clouds that yes are supposed to be protected but you know can honestly be uh, intercepted at any point um, and basically signing our our lives and freedoms away uh, 
not reading through these gigantic uh, you know, terms of service agreements before checking a box so we can get the latest app or iTunes update or whatever. Uh, it's really interesting stuff and I think uh, if you watch this 1984 with 2019 in mind, you'll see some parallels that might make you kind of uncomfortable, no matter which side of the political aisle you're on. So that's it for now. I think uh, that's about as high a recommendation as I can give to 1984 uh, from the Criterion Collection. You can get it at Criterion.com. Uh, you can get it through Amazon or wherever you buy your movies. I don't know if Barnes & Noble is still having the 50% off Criterion sale, but if they are, definitely go out and get it. Uh, it's well worth your time. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed this installment of Criterion Cove or whatever it ends up being called. It can't be the corner even though. Mm -hmm. But uh, thanks very much and uh, come back next week when uh, I will have a review of a book, uh, John Kitley's uh, excellent book called Discover the Horror, which also just came out, um, and is one of the things that prompted me to watch all of the special features on 1984, uh, because in that book, which is about uh, a man's journey through uh, horror fandom throughout 50 years of life. Uh, he talks about diving into movies and genres that he loves, and that includes like absorbing all the reference material he can find. Now, normally on special features, I watch a couple of things and I just kind of, you know, leave them and say, okay, I'll get back to that commentary or that feature at later. But uh, with 1984, I dug in, I watched everything. It's uniformly fantastic. Even the, the film trailer, which are ultimately, you know, kind of disposable artifacts that are just included on most of these discs because, you know, for completionists, I get, I guess, watching that trailer, uh, you get to see the contrast of how the movie was sold. Uh, the, the colors of the characters are this kind of these rich, orangey pinks, uh, very vibrant, but the final film uh, is practically black and white in terms of the contrast. Uh, I don't exactly know what that means, um, but uh, it's certainly interesting because uh, watching 1984 and then watching the trailer, uh, you get the sense that there are just two different movies and you can imagine people being <laughs> possibly kind of upset going into the theater and seeing why is this all washed out. Uh, there's a reason for that, and Deakins explains in his excellent interview uh, why and how uh, that process, that effect, uh, was put into place. So, great stuff. So, again, uh, thank you, and talk soon.